In time of austerity in the country and cutbacks across a range of services, the idea that reducing travelling time by businessmen by 30 minutes from Birmingham to London or by one hour from Manchester to London is absolutely farcical. It seems to completely forget the fact that businessmen on trains nowadays tend to work on trains. They, they use computers, they use mobile phones, and I've not had one single solitary businessman in Birmingham who said to me, unless this project goes ahead and unless I can travel from Birmingham to London 30 minutes quicker, my business is going to suffer and I will be in danger. Well, I'll come straight back to him on that point because I've met with a lot of businesses in Birmingham who are arguing very, very strongly for HS2. And a lot of your uh, the Honourable Gentleman's constituents are definitely asking for it. It was detailed. Well, Mr Deputy Speaker, I say again, I've not had one businessman who has come to me to make the argument this, this project is absolutely desperate. Mr Deputy Speaker, Secretaries of State always like to leave a legacy. And I understand that. But High Speed 2, I believe, will not be a legacy. <laughs> I believe it's a vanity project, and if it goes ahead, I believe it could turn into a white elephant. Just to say, the interventions have taken a lot of time up. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And may I draw the House's attention to my previous declaration that not only does the proposed route of HS2 bisect my beautiful constituency, it also runs within 100 yards of my home. Mr Deputy Speaker, I came to this place to try and do the right things for my constituents and indeed my country. I seem to find the large amount of my time and effort is spent trying to stop bad things happening, which my constituents often reassure me amounts to much the same ends. However, I can assure Madam Deputy Speaker it's nowhere near as satisfying. And there are a few projects that I have ever believed are such a bad thing not only for my constituents but also for the country as HS2. My constituency will take all of the pain for none of the gain if this goes ahead. What are we are actually being asked for to vote for today is the signing of a bank cheque for HS2 Limited for a railway which, in my opinion, is a solution looking for a problem. A scheme of a vast financial cost to the taxpayer and a high human cost for those unfortunate enough to live or to have their business on or near the proposed route. The financial cost that the government initially estimated at 33 billion this morning and which now stands at over £42 billion this afternoon, with a further £7.5 billion for rolling stock, is an enormous commitment at a time of austerity for a project which will not be ready until 2033 and is of questionable economic benefit. How can we be certain that today's £10 billion of additional budget will prove to be the last? Certainly when it comes to keeping to budget, government rail projects have a terrible record. The West Coast Main Line upgrade which was initially estimated to cost £1.5 billion, ended up costing £9.9 .9 billion. The Thameslink upgrade was estimated to cost £650 million in 1996, and the, answer, the end cost will be nearer £6 billion when completed. What we could be looking at is a project with a final bill, many tens of billions more than the government's initial estimate and even today's estimate. All this for a railway where the cost-benefit ratio analysis even before today's £10 billion, didn't actually stack up. For phase one, the Department of Transport claims HS2 will produce £1.40 of benefits for every pound spent. The government categorises uh, schemes below £1.50 as being low value for money, and that's before today's extra £10 billion. Pounds. Will my honourable friend give away? I certainly will. I'm grateful to my honourable friend. Um, and would he agree with me that it's, uh, the cost-benefit um, has actually been pushed to one side? Uh, by the ministers today, and now we're claiming its capacity. But hasn't it been true with this project that one moment it's capacity, the next it's speed, the next it's restoring the north-south balance, that the objectives are always used to fit whatever the argument is and seem to move around? I thank my right honourable friend for that intervention. It's absolutely right. Uh, and I will be dealing with the issue of capacity later in my speech. Um, coming back to the cost-benefit ratios, they are very questionable. As has already been pointed out, the assumption is that all time spent on trains is wasted time. So the figures are based on the extraordinary idea that when someone goes on a train, they don't do any work, which anyone who does travel on our railways was no, will know is certainly not the case. It should also be noted that compared to our European neighbours, journey times between first and second cities are considerably shorter in the UK. 
and time between Birmingham and London, already half the journey times of high-speed rail travel on, in France and Spain. I'll give way to my honourable friend. I thank the member for giving way. He, he makes the point, as others have made, that the business case does not properly reflect productive time, iPads and all of the rest of it. Page 51 of the business case addresses this point explicitly and makes the point that if trains are overcrowded, you can't stand up and work on, and work on PCs. And actually, the business case would be better if it took this into account. My humble friend makes a, makes a valid point, but I will be dealing with the issue of capacity later on in my speech, and I hope I can address that. So when the argument about time saving comes, uh, is made, that made the point several times that other honourable members have made it in the House today. I have never met a business person in my career who's ever said to me the reason their business isn't thriving is because they can't get to London quickly enough. Another argument cited is that HS2 will rebalance our economy. And this is an argument I actually agree with, because I do believe it will rebalance our economy further in favour of London and the South East. Indeed, there are no serious academics that support the view that HS2 will reduce the North-South divide. For weekend and leisure travel, for instance, what is the more likely scenario? That more families will be travelling from London to spend an evening in Birmingham or Manchester, or that families from Birmingham and Manchester will be using the route to spend time and money in London. I would suggest to Honourable and Right Honourable Members that the latter is the more likely scenario, and that HS2 will simply suck more money from the regions into London and the South East. I would therefore um, appeal to all honourable members in the House to think very carefully about whether they are acting in the best interests of their constituents by supporting the signing of this blank cheque for this white elephant of a project, which before further cost overruns is already projected to be costing every constituency in this country £75 million. And with the expected overruns, this could easily be nearer to £100 million plus. Are you, are honourable and right honourable members, prepared to support a scheme which will inevitably suck money away from transport schemes that could benefit your own constituencies? Um, with, with regard to capacity, uh, figures are showing that um, the West Coast Main Line already has capacity for a 100% increase in passenger numbers, as proposed by First Group when they put forward their franchise bid. Uh, Madam Deputy Speaker, <laughs> with pleasure and some trepidation. Uh, <laughs> does the Honourable Member that it's been stated quite categorically that capacity will be reached by 2026, yeah. that other people think it'll be reached earlier, and has he travelled on a London Midland train to London where he can't get a seat and can hardly get in the door? Yeah. I, I, put it to the, I put it to the Honourable Member, that, uh, my Honourable Friend, that anyone predicting the capacity or the demand for any commodity or product 20 years from now is, is living in dreamland. Yeah. The capacity on the railway was driven by punitive taxes on, corp, on, on company cars in the 90s and that will level out. Yeah, yeah. In conclusion, Madam Deputy Speaker, HS2 is a huge project which will take a lot of stopping, but I put it to the House that you wouldn't eat an elephant in one sitting even if it was a white one. And this debate is merely the first serving of many. I do not believe that this project is the best use of taxpayers' money, and I would therefore urge honourable and right honourable members to support the reasoned amendment and vote against the bill. Natasha Engel. Madam Deputy Speaker, um, I will be voting for the amendment today and yeah. against the second reading of this bill because I believe that it is the wrong scheme at the wrong time. Yeah. Um, and I also, Madam Deputy Speaker, in the short time available, want to make a passionate defence of nimbyism, because I think actually in this case, where it's not so much not in my backyard as through my front door and through the rest of my house, and that actually when we look at those people whose lives this is affecting, this is far more serious than just saying how much compensation do you want. The villages and towns that the train will be going through if the scheme goes ahead, those people are being expected to wait for 20 years with this hanging over their heads, with no shovel in the ground anywhere in North East Derbyshire, not being able to sell their homes and losing money hand over fist in very small rural businesses. I give way. 
Honourable Lady for giving way, and I pay tribute to her. There's very rarely an occasion when I don't agree with her. I've had constituents who've literally been suicidal over this because they've had a complete lack of sympathy and an inability to access compensation in spite of a failing business. And so does she share my concern that we must get the compensation right? Uh, absolutely. And I think the suggestions that have been made where the compensation schemes should really mirror what happens in other countries, such as France, where big infrastructure projects go ahead with no problems, do so because the compensation schemes are extremely generous. But actually, it's not compensation that people are after. What they're asking is, I have lived in this town, in this village, for four or five generations. I don't want to move. And I'm being asked to take all the disbenefits without taking any of the benefits that HS2 will bring. And so that is why, actually, if I were representing one of the major towns, I would be able possibly to see the benefits of this. But to a place like North East Derbyshire, it does not bring us any economic benefits. And in fact, it does exactly the reverse. And what I can't see the sense in, and I would really welcome the Minister's response to this, what I cannot see the, the sense in is where Derbyshire County Council has spent many years now cleaning up, developing and redeveloping sites that were ruined by uh, the, the, the results of the mining industry um, stopping and the steel industry in Sheffield. These places over decades now have slowly been brought back into the economy. Up to £77 million has already been spent in Markham Vale, um, which is uh, an area that is shared by myself and the uh, Honourable Member for Bolsover. £77 million is going to be wiped off because HS2 will be going straight through it. Chesterfield Canal, one of the best and biggest pieces of redevelopment um, and regeneration in North East Derbyshire, which is bringing investment to the Chesterfield Waterside um, project, will not have a Waterside project and will now not get the £310 million of investment that is coming into the local economy. And then we get the very small businesses in, in uh, towns like uh, villages like Renishaw. You know, these are very small businesses where the villages are, you know, they, 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 they become the focal points where already, where only months after the route has been published, that a local wedding business has lost £70,000 already. And this is 20 years before anything is due to happen. Absolutely. The Honourable Lady, forgive way. And with regard to businesses uh, affected by the route, is she aware that about 30% of the businesses who could be affected on the route have indicated that they, that they actually wouldn't relocate, they would actually just close down and all those jobs would be lost all the way along the route? That's absolutely right. And that is, that is an issue that affects rural areas in a way that it does not affect uh, cities. Um, and that's something where I don't think that when we're talking about a national economic policy on HS2, what we're not distinguishing is between the cities and the, and the rural areas. And I was going to go into the, sort of the, the detail of uh, you know, the, the issues about connecting cities, absolutely it connects cities, but that's not the issue for people who live in North East Derbyshire. In Appenall, you want to get a bus to the hospital, you don't want to go to London. In the recent public meetings that I've had, attended by hundreds of people, we asked in each of those me meetings, when was the last time anybody went to London? London. Well, in the last five years, in, in, in one group of 300 people, five people raised their hands. This is not for the benefit of the people of North East Derbyshire. Um, and I think also with the business and the, the economic case, um, I have really serious doubts. That, that they've been raised across the House, and, uh, and, and, and I, 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 I'm not going to re-rehearse them. What I do want to say, though, is in the consultation, that is the part of the whole of this project that I have found most disappointing. HS2 Limited have been very good at consulting stakeholders. Stakeholders don't, though, include those people whose houses and businesses this is going through. And I think the project has really failed at that level of actually going and talking to people, not just persuading them of why it is that the train has to come through their front room, but actually to say why it is that, um, that a high-speed rail uh, link is, is needed. People are just not convinced. At the same time as the uh, hardship scheme, we're being told that the, the route has not yet been fixed. 
but uh, that the consultation hasn't even been opened and therefore no decisions can be made on, on where the route is actually going to go. At the same time though, not very far away from my constituency, a kink has been put in to um, get the train to go around Firth Ricks and the steelworks in Sheffield. Why are we allowing and announcing uh, changes to the route when the consultation hasn't even been opened? And if then the Department of Transport and HS2 Limited are actually open to persuasion, um, then could they please put in a kink and go all the way around North East Derbyshire? Thank you very much. Andrew, let's